I want to welcome you all to our Easter service here this morning. It's good to have you back with us, and we're excited to celebrate our risen Lord this morning. Christ is risen. He is risen. And you say, He's risen indeed. Let's try it again. Christ is risen. He's risen risen indeed. indeed. Amen. We're going to start things off by hearing our choir this morning. So just sit back and listen and worship along with the choir this morning. you to look like you believe it okay okay because some of you oh you look like a sad Sunday morning okay let's smile and he lives all right here we go now
again. Thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you for that wonderful choir piece for us. I hope you're coping well with isolation. It's not an easy time, but during this time, I hope, especially this morning, I, I hope you can just take some time to be thinking about how Jesus managed to get to that place of life on the other side of the cross. And what I often have been thinking about in this last little while is that Jesus prepared for that resurrection life in the Garden of Gethsemane. In silence, in being alone, he was in prayer with his heavenly Father. And during that time, Jesus found the strength to go to the cross and to come out on the other side of eternal life. And I trust that you're, you are moving through this time well, looking for ways to find life in, in all of your relationships and whatever you are doing and in your relationship with your Heavenly Father. And I'm not talking just about the life of a beating heart. I'm talking about the life that comes, that God gives us, that we can experience eternal life every day. I hope you're able to find the Good Friday Reflections on your website on nbcchurch.ca. And uh, we are also doing a vlog or a, a little dialogue sessions. We're going to try and do a couple more this week, Nixon and I. So thank you to Nixon also in being a part of this. And if there are topics that you would like us to talk about, by all means, let us know. Uh, things you're thinking about at this time or struggling with or maybe something you'd love to just focus on to praise God about. But um, I want you this week to be thinking about life. The resurrection is all about life. This time of year is a beautiful time to be thinking about life. It's springtime. I hope you're getting outside. I hope you're starting to see as things slowly warm up, a lot slower than we had hoped, but they are warming up. And even behind all that snow, things are starting to come to life. So look for life. And in your own life, be thinking about what is it that makes you feel alive? What brings life and energy to what you do? Where in the scriptures do you go to to find life? Do you go maybe the Psalms, maybe Philippians, the Gospels? But I want to encourage you to focus on life this week. I'm really fortunate, this is a little side note, but I'm really fortunate to have a beautiful wife that I get to be in isolation with. And uh, she is a great cook, and I just thank God so much for her. And this week I had the added bonus of time where we can't get out and get haircuts. She's able to cut my hair. So I am so thankful for her right now. And remember, if you're having any kind of trouble or you know somebody who's having trouble connecting to our services, please let us know. Um, we are able to do DVDs for you of the service if that is needed or even mail copies of the transcripts. So please let us know. I want to thank everybody again for continuing to give through email and through mailing in checks and so on at finance.nbc sorry, finance at nbcchurch.ca you've been giving and also mailing to the church address. And because of your faithfulness, we're able to continue to get the news out to people who need to hear about the good news of Jesus and the gospel, not only in the city, but around the world. It continues to spread, so thank you. Let's continue our worship time with some prayer. God, I just thank you so much that you are here among us, that this situation we're in is not a surprise and while we may feel alone you are with every person connecting us all together it is your life that connects us and God we just thank you for your son Jesus who not only died for our sins but rose again as proof that you are alive forever and that death cannot hold you and so God I just pray that as we worship you together today that you would be close to each person, that you would fill us with your spirit and you would give us strength in this time, not only for ourselves, but to pour out into those around us on the phone and as we speak to people. Thank you for this service this morning. Go before us in your beautiful name. Amen. 
We're going to continue in worship, and then Nixon will come and share a few words with us. They all walked away with nothing to say. They had just lost their dearest friend. All that he said, and now he was dead. So this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail, how could a night be so long? The angel, the star, the kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done. They had taken their son, wasted before his time. She knew it was true. She'd watched him die too. She'd heard them call him just a man. But deep in her heart, she knew from the start, somehow her son would live again. Then came the morning, and night turned into day. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn, then came the morning, shadows vanished before the sun, death had lost and life had won. Oh, and sons will see what's to come before the Messiah's return. Oh, wonders and signs, plans and designs will pay out their final day. Rumors and war will threaten no more. The waiting bride is caught away. Here comes the morning. And night has turned to day. The clouds will roll away. And life has won For morning has a
Good morning, North Mount Baptist Church. First of all, we would like to apologize for the choppiness in the video that is uh, right now playing online. Um, yep, we are trying to fix it. We will fix it. But happy Resurrection Sunday. The Lord is risen. This is the joy of today. The joy of the message that we have is He is risen. He is no more dead. And you and I can celebrate the power of his resurrection. You know, I was watching this uh, movie, Gladiator, and there you have this Maximus who's coming, and he's talking to this army. He's saying, we are dead already. Therefore, we do not fear death anymore. And as we go to fight, let's not worry about death because we are already dead. And Christians are on the same line, actually speaking. You know, when we talk about resurrection, we are people who have given ourselves to Jesus, and we are dead already. Romans chapter 6 is a wonderful passage to kind of look into, and Apostle Paul talks to the Romans again, the same kind of people Maximus is speaking to, and, and Romans uh, says in Romans chapter 6, Verses 4 says, Therefore we have been buried with him through the baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Walking in the newness of life. You and I are people who have this newness of life. You know, in the world we are seeing people talking so much about death, Every time I turn on the TV, it's depressing. Talking about the news in Canada, in India, in US, in Italy, around the world, what we are talking about is how many are infected, how many have died, and the rate of recovery is so low, and it's depressing. But today, you and I can be rest assured that you and I are people who are resurrected in Christ Jesus. You and I have overcome death. And Jesus is our resurrection and our life. Let's not be worried about the fear around us. Let's spread the hope of resurrection. Let's share this joy that we have. Yes, there is fear outside. Yes, there is a virus outside. I need to be careful. But inside my heart, there is joy. There's a joy in my heart which says, I have overcome death. Even if death meets me, I'm not afraid because in Christ I will be alive. I have the power of resurrection in me. Even though I die, I'm going to rise up again and live with him. That is the hope of this Resurrection Sunday. Let's go and share this message to people. You know, it's a joy to be a Christian. It's a joy to experience this power of resurrection. May the power of Easter take control over all the sadness that you may be hearing around. All the quarantine and all that may just disappear and that let's rest and remain in the power of God's resurrection. God bless you. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. <coughs> Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much this morning. We are so excited to know that we are people who have a part in your resurrection because we have believed in your work of salvation. God, we pray for the world around us. <clears throat> pray for friends, family, those who are so afraid of dying. God, we pray that this Easter, that we may share the message of the power of your resurrection, that we may Find courage in the power of your resurrection as we share this message. Lord, help us not to be like the people in the world who walk in fear. Help us to be people who walk in confidence, taking care of ourselves, being a witness to you. God, we pray for each and every member of North Mount Baptist Church, everyone who's associated everyone who is watching this video. God, we pray that if there is anyone who is listening to this service, who has not experienced the power of resurrection, who has not put themselves into the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, 
that they may accept your way of salvation and enjoy the joy of salvation that we have and they may celebrate life together with us. We ask this prayer in your precious name. Amen. Good morning. Let me add my just joyous, happy Easter and may God's blessing really just flow to you at this time. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 53, and I'm reading from the NIV version. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortality with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortality with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is in the Lord, is not in vain. The word of the Lord. What can I give to the one that died for me? What can I give to the one I nailed upon the tree? For I know I could never give anything he needs, but I know I can give him all of me. What can I give for he knit me in the womb? What can I give to the one that rose up from the tomb? For I know I could never give anything he needs, but I know I can give him all of me. There are times I can forget and listen to my doubts, but he soon shows me that it's him that I can't live without. But sin slowly still creeps in and struggling I fall, but I'm forgiven by his grace so I can What can I give to the one who died for me? What can I give to the one that set my spirit free? For I know I could never give anything he needs, but I know I can give him all of me.
Welcome back, and uh, so good to have some beautiful musicians to help us in all of this. And I want to just encourage you to say thank you to the many people that have a part in putting this all together. Gabriel spends many hours just uh, getting things coordinated and ready, and he's on his headset and listening in and trying to get everything together as we go. Um, Ray puts in many hours during the week to add in some of the choir pieces, and certainly Vic and Vi and Brian and Haram and others have pre-recorded some of the music that we hear, so we're very grateful. And then having Mobeni come and help us with the uh, video of the live streaming, and Nixon to not only encourage many of you on the phone, but also to be here and to lift our spirits. Isn't he a, a very uplifting, encouraging, positive spirit? It's wonderful to have. So I feel very blessed to have a team around me to help in this. As we turn to the scriptures this Sunday morning, I, I think many of us are still thinking in our heads, is this really real? I don't think there's ever been a time as difficult as this time in history where we have statistics on death at our fin fingertips at any moment. And yes, there's no question that World War I, World War II, Spanish flu, those things that are being talked a lot about, um, there are many more deaths, than ex exponentially more deaths than we're experiencing today. And yet none of those life-altering events had the level of global news and statistics in front of us at a click of a button. And yet every day now we're confronted with how many cases of COVID-19 and how many deaths are occurring by the minute. And not only in our city, in our province, in our country, but also around the world. You can find the st stats on just about any country. And with this, as Nixon alluded to earlier, it brings with it kind of an unhealthy focus on death. Yes, we want to be aware, but it, there's too much focus on death. In fact, I believe so much of the focus on social distancing, and rightly so, and the shutdown of our economy and the worldwide lockdown really has to do with our fear of death. And into the middle of this, front and center, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we're celebrating today. Amen? God is here and he has risen. And there is no other event in the history of man that stands against this current fear of death and our tendency to immobilize more than the life of Jesus. And the whole point of the resurrection story, the fact that Jesus arose on the third day after his crucifixion and death is it's this highly relevant to this question that we are facing today. Namely, what can we do about death? In fact, it's the question many people are thinking about right now. How do we control the death rate? What do we do today to ensure that we're going to be alive tomorrow personally? And surely, this is one of the questions that predominates in many minds today, or at least in their subconscious if they don't want to face it. And at a time when the world is not allowing us many escapes, we can't get out and do a lot of things that we escape too often, we're faced with the reality of dying my death is the one thing that nobody else can do for me. I have to face this myself. So I want us this morning to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul writes about the one true antidote to death today. And it's not just a de an antidote for this moment, but forever. At the time of Paul writing 2 Timothy, Paul was probably writing his last letter. And he writes to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. Likely Paul was in isolation, forced isolation, mind, albeit, at Mamertine Prison in Rome, where he was awaiting his own death. And as you read the second letter to Timothy, you can see that he was quite aware that his own end was drawing to a close. And he felt that he probably would not get out of it alive, and he didn't. Which makes the words that he pens about life and death that much more poignant. 
Listen while I read. First, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Read along with me. I'd encourage you to open up your Bibles where you are at home, or you can look on your screens or wherever you can find it. But it's good to, for us to actually see the words of God. So you can underline and so on. 2 Timothy 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us not does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Now listen carefully. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as the powder, pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now I want to draw our attention back to verse 10, particularly one phrase. He's talking, Paul is talking to Timothy about the grace we've been given by faith in Jesus. And speaking of Jesus in verse 10, he elaborates by saying some really radical words in the second part of verse 10. He says this, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and listen carefully. This is a man who is facing his own imminent death. He says, appearing through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now this is radical, and it doesn't matter whether you believe in Jesus or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. Paul is making the claim that Jesus destroyed, that he abolished, put an end to death. Amen? That one statement alone, regardless of our beliefs, should get your attention. And clearly, Paul is not saying that Jesus was going to eliminate physical death. I mean, Paul was expecting his imminent death. He didn't expect to be whisked off to heaven and avoid death. And even today, in spite of all the medical advances, the death rate after Christ, even among Christians, is still steady at 100%. We all die, right? But Paul did mean something by the word when he says he abolished death. Listen carefully to how the writer to the Hebrews explains it and talks about Jesus' mission on earth. He says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. 
Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So Jesus comes to take part in our nature. And by dying, he destroyed the power of death. And in living again, he draws us all into this forever life that he, he has. And thereby, he takes away the power or the sting of death. It's amazing, amen? So Jesus abolishes the fear of death. He makes it harmless. Now there's always those who maybe don't believe in Jesus. And they say, you know what? I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of dying. So tell me this then. Why is it that pervasively through our culture, we don't like to talk about death? There are newspapers that won't even use the word death anymore in their paper. It's a choice they make. When we talk about death, usually we talk about somebody passing away. We talk about somebody who's departed. And even in um, funerals, when we put people into the grave, we often don't talk about coffins anymore. We don't like those words, so we use casket or some other word. And as a pastor, I am finding more and more people that want a service for somebody who's passed on less and less. And if they do have one, they keep it really short. They want to get out of there quickly. And often, the viewings are rarer in services as well. We don't want to see death. Dostoevsky, a well-known Russian writer, he once faced a firing squad and was delivered just at the last possible moment. And as he writes about this later, alluding to that event, he says, the certainty of inescapable death and the uncertainty of what is to follow are the most dreadful anguishes in the world. I mean, isn't that what it's about? The uncertainty of what is to follow? This is what Paul said, calls the sting of death. It hurts. We don't like it. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 56 that Ray Wensley read earlier in our scripture, he says that the sting of death is what? It's sin. Sin is the sting of death. Which makes sense when we think that it was sin that caused death in the first place. And the passage above in Hebrews says that the fear of death produces this lifelong bondage and limits us. And it's what causes many of our hang-ups in life. And we see this fear of death displaying and coming out in many different ways in people's lives. First of all, it drives us. People are always in a hurry. They, they want to keep busy so they don't have to have silence to think about death. They don't want to think about it. It creates this restless spirit, spirit in us. Many of you are experiencing that restlessness right now. And so we are driven by the shortness of our lives and we don't want to face death. Secondly, that fear of death makes us worry, which is behind all of our safety stuff behind our helmets and seatbelts and insurance and diets and doctor's visits and all the infinite amount of protective measures to keep us alive as long as possible so that we don't have to deal with death. And thirdly, this fear of death sobers us. Sometimes we're careful not to be too joyful in case it sweeps us away. The moment we, sometimes we are afraid of love in case we lose what we loved. And so this fear of death produces this damper on our emotions and our feelings and often causes us to move away from the risks of love and life and living and joy. And also this fear haunts us. It hits us in our dreams. I have a recurring dream of running away from the enemy in a battle. Incidentally, I always wake up before I die, which is a good thing, I suppose. And often we're also afraid to be alone. We don't like silence. Many of us can't go through the day 
without their earbuds in or the radio on or TV. And so if all of this is true, there isn't a better time to talk about Easter. This story about a man named Jesus saying he's the son of God, actually dying on a cross, having a Roman soldier thrust his spear in his side to make sure he was dead. And yet the same God comes back to life and they look and there's an empty tomb. He is living. He is alive forever. And see, the central theme of the empty tomb is that for the first time in history, a breakthrough has happened regarding death. Amen? It was so radical. It was so unexpected that even his closest friends that he had prepared for this event did not expect it. And as a result, he offers a break in this power of death and the fear of it for anybody who comes to know him. And Jesus does this in two ways. First of all, he removes the fear of judgment by the forgiveness of sins. See, this is central to our Christian faith. In the mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is doing something that we men and women, we don't fully understand. There's a mystery about this. But it, nevertheless, it's true that God has accomplished the solution for this basic human problem of evil and sin, which hounds us everywhere we go. And God solves this problem on the cross of Christ. He lays our sin on Jesus. I don't know how it all happens, but God has said it and God has done it in Jesus. It's one of those great mysteries which God declares, which we struggle to understand. But God has done it. And in Jesus, humans are forgiven forever if we choose to believe in him. And the amazing thing is once we really take hold of this forgiveness, there's this reaction of joy and gladness, of relief, of feeling clean inside for the first time in our lives, having this huge burden lifted of the past, of what we've done wrong, as the sin, this burden of sin is taken away. And with that, that fear of judgment and death goes with it. This is incredible. It's not like because we know a little bit more about Jesus and what he's done, we might pass the test when we die. No. In Christ, we are free from any kind of condemnation. This is an amazing declaration which the scriptures reinforce. If you look at eight, Romans chapter 8 verse 1, it says this, Therefore, there is now, today, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is, those who are in relationship with Jesus Christ. And then again in John chapter 5 verse 24, John explains, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me, this is Jesus speaking, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. See, we don't have to wait till heaven to experience life. And if you have a life in you that cannot be taken away, then death is kind of meaningless, isn't it? Because you will always have that life of Jesus in you, whether you're here in the body or whether you're taken into heaven. Amen? Often in my life, Satan loves to keep on piling on the guilt every time I do something wrong. Because we still do sin as Christians. And if you're not a believer today, let me just take away all the facade and all the quick smiles. Christians are broken people too. We all make mistakes. The beautiful thing is that when Christ comes in and we begin a relationship, the guilt of sin, the weight of it is gone and we feel clean. We enjoy our new life. And God proved through Jesus by raising him from the dead the validity of the promises that he made to us. And there really is freedom 
from this fear of death. And the ability to face God with confidence that in Christ, our sins are completely forgiven. That we are actually called saints. Everybody listening there, if you're a believer, guess what God calls you? You are a saint li listening in this morning. The second thing Jesus does is to promise us life with him. Not only does he forgive us, not only does he take away all condemnation, but he promises you life in the middle of your isolation, in the middle of your alone time and silence. God says, I give you life in Jesus. In John, in, in John 14, Jesus says, because I live, you too shall live. And he demonstrated his ability to fill that promise by rising from the dead himself. And to me, that's the critical fact. It's what convinces me that I can trust Jesus, as opposed to anyone else saying something like that these days. Paul, and, and Paul emphasizes this when he tells us that if it weren't for the resurrection, all the promises of God would ring hollow, wouldn't they? But he did rise. And hundreds of witnesses saw him. And when we experience his reality today in our lives, it confirms his life to us again and again. And it's that amazing resurrection and this continual life and empowering that God through Jesus has changed my whole outlook on death. That's why the Apostle Paul and those early Christians, as they're contemplating their own approaching death, and a reality of it happening at any time. They don't, you don't hear the terror of death in Paul's voice and in his words. There's no fear. And Paul says, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It's gone. As a pastor, I have stood beside many graves and seen the impact of death on those left behind. Sometimes people fall apart. They feel lost. Sometimes people don't want to face it and quickly leave as soon as they can. But every once in a while, when a person has had a close walk with Jesus and the people around know Jesus as well, there's this incredible joy and that funeral becomes a celebration of a life well lived and of a future that is real and palpable and starting immediately. I can't explain it except in the story of Jesus. And out of those cross relationships with Jesus, free from guilt and condemnation, Paul writes in Philippians as he anticipates death. He says this, Yes, and I'm going to continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will be in no way ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to be heart, depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. See, when you know Jesus so much that your life, his life, fills you, then it's like, if I'm alive here on earth, great. So much that God has for us. If I'm dead, great. I get to go and be with him. It's okay. So death just becomes this moment of tra transition from life here on earth to the next. And you experience joy beyond expression. I'm going to close with a letter written to the parents of a young soldier who was in prison in Hamburg during World War II after he was captured and sentenced to be executed. He, he writes this to his parents. When this letter comes to your hands and I shall no longer be among the living, the thing has, that has occupied my thoughts constantly for many months never leaving them free, is now about to happen. If you ask me what state I'm in, I can only answer, I am first in a joyous mood. 
and second, filled with great anticipation. As regards the first feeling, today means the end of all suffering and all earthly sorrow for me. God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. What consolation, what marvelous strength emanates from faith in Christ, who has preceded us in death. Everything that till now I have done and struggled for and accomplished has at bottom been directed to this one goal, whose barrier I shall penetrate today. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard, Neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. For me, believing will become seeing, hope will become possession, and I shall forever share in him who is love. Should I not then be filled with anticipation? What is all this going to be like? The things that up to this time I've been permitted to preach about, I shall now see. There's not going to be any more secrets or tormenting puzzles. Today is that great day when we anticipate going home to be with our Father. How can I fail to be excited and full of anticipation? Then I shall see once more all those who've been near and dear to me here on earth. And so until we meet again above in the presence of the Father light, your joyful son, Herman. Now isn't that it? authentic Christian confidence in the face of death. He is facing the reality of it. And born of this great fact today, we celebrate a Jesus who is risen from the dead. It's a fact that's captured in history, attested to by many hundreds of competent witnesses, and confirmed by the experience of thousands throughout history that Jesus truly is alive. He answers our prayers. He lives in us and he gives us strength. And he not only offers to remove the fear of death for anybody listening, but he also gives us the strength that life demands. Jesus died for us so that he could live in us. It's here that Christians fi find the supply they need to face the pressures and the problems and dangers that life sets before them. And God's offer stands for you today. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, that is, you express your faith, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved forever. There will take place in your life this simple transaction by which Jesus Christ comes to live within you and to give you this hope that surpasses this life, which goes beyond the grave, that removes all the fear of death and terror so that you can face everything that comes your way, including this current situation. Isn't that worth something? There is nothing like it anywhere. No product offered anywhere can equal it. That's why today we take great joy in declaring to you what we have found in Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, Lord of lords and King of kings, before whom eventually every knee will bow on heaven and on earth, and every tongue is going to confess, proclaim Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. He has solved the problem of history, the problem of death, and he's able to meet each of your needs for life today. Amen. May God grant that today you may discover the living Lord. Let's pray as we close. Lord, I thank you for each person who has listened in today. I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your spirit. It is only through your spirit that we find life. It is only when we connect to you and believe in you and have a relationship that we begin to experience life today. Give us the courage to enter so fully into my, our relationship with you that we no longer fear death. I pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen.